<laughs> and I, I come to you today um, not as a philosopher, um, but as, as a scholar of literature. And uh, I'm a Faulkner scholar in particular, and I told Nathan that I would not give a paper on Faulkner, but I, I, I couldn't help but sneak a few moments in about Faulkner. Um, because indeed, for me, I, I think of everything through the filters of Faulkner. Um, <laughs> it's sort of impossible once you start reading him. He sort of takes over. Um, my paper today might also seem um, anti-philosophical, and that is not my intention. And so I'll just say this as a caveat that what I'm hoping to do is to produce a series of differences that I'm trying to inhabit. Um, and we might think of kind of two related positions, the philosopher and the critic. Um, and my paper, in some ways, was um, inspired by this very interesting piece by Mary Beard that came out um, in the London Review of Books recently on the public voice of women. And she began with this moment of Penelope um, being asked to leave the scene of men's talk. And, uh, it, it made me think that there were more moments like this in, in the history of, of Western letters. And inevitably, I was led to think of the Phaedo. Um, but I'll, I'll get there in just a moment by, by way of a detour. Um, in Faulkner's As I Lay Dying, the voice of Addie Bundren suddenly appears in the middle of a book that's after her death. Words, she says, are a shape to fill a lack. They don't ever fit what they are trying to say at. Words, she also says, are just the gaps in people's lacks coming down like the cries of geese out of the wild darkness in the old terrible nights, fumbling at the deeds like orphans to whom are pointed out in a crowd two faces and told, that is your father, your mother. Has Addie survived her death to speak to us? To survive one's death, we might say, is also to find the impossible pleasure of total revenge. Her final wish is that her corpse be brought to the town of Jefferson. Um, and indeed, it's a kind of final joke on her family, because just after she dies, the, the bridge washes out, and they must carry the coffin over the river. In introducing her disembodied voice, Faulkner also introduces the possibility that she might survive her own death, that she might enjoy the suffering of her survivors as they must cope with the brute burden of her corpse. This is the impasse of many fantasies of suicide. One would no longer be there to see the suffering of those who made one suffer. Thought cannot go beyond that desire for witnessing a darker version of the very proof of existence for Descartes. One cannot think unthinking. What death teaches in As I Lay Dying is the emergence of the speaking subject out of the primary displacement of the mother as the primary other. We might say that it is Addie's dead voice that is the condition of the novel's very claim to language. It is well known that the Phaedo also documents the death and last words of Socrates, in which he confirms his theory of the soul's immortality and the claim that philosophy is the practice of dying. Framed as Phaedo repeating the story of Socrates' final hours and with it, his last argument concerning knowledge as recollection of what the soul gleaned before embodiment, Phaedo repeats the story to Echimentes, who was not present. The very structure of the dialogue raises the dead and gives the words of Socrates out of the mouth of Phaedo. When Echimentes asks who else was present in those final hours, Phaedo somewhat astonishingly remarks that Plato, if he remembers correctly, wasn't there. He wasn't strong enough to attend. As Nicole Lara writes of this moment, behind the narrator with the faulty memory stands Plato, the writer. It is, she continues, quote, Socrates himself who does the most to persuade us of the truth of the Phaedo, the truth of the philosopher's last months, which the dialogue stages so imaginatively that the reader feels he is actually present. Also, the truth of the arguments in favor of the immortality of the soul, which rather depend on Socrates' presence to carry conviction." End quote. Indeed, if pistis, or conviction in rhetorical practice, is an embodied experience, 
The person and the logos of Socrates mutually reinforce one another. Here we might turn to P. Christopher, P. P. Christopher Smith. He wrote this wonderful book um, called The Hermeneutics of Original Argument. It's been grossly um, neglected. Um, and he, he recuperates original argument um, in terms of this idea of pistis. Uh, Plato, who distinguishes between two groups of words, those related to pistis or conviction and belief, and didaskine or those related to instruction and learning. For Plato, in contrast to the teachers of rhetoric, pistis is embodied, working upon the listener at the physical level of the passions. Pistis thus, quote, concerns things wholly incidental and ciliary to language, whereas the second set concerns only the things that are essential to it, end quote. All transmission, however, calls upon what Plutarch once called the ambiguity of listening. And Foucault also describes this in the hermeneutics of the subject. Because listening is both the most pathetikos and the most logikos of the senses. Only the ear can receive the logos. But it is the same medium of pathos. The ear must be trained, as Plutarch describes, to purge, to not admit what is pathetikos in the course of transmission. We have remarked on Socrates' willingness to die, or the notion that philosophy is the practice of dying. In Crito, his friends meet him in jail to implore him to escape, and this is an idea which he rejects. In Phaedo, he goes further to assert not only that his death will be at the hands of the state, but also that suicide is unethical. He would rather be killed than kill himself. We have remarked upon this time and again, but what of Socrates' unwillingness to die that arises in this moment? This is not simply what Nietzsche calls Socrates' decadence, and his translation of Socrates' final words are, to live is to be sick a long time. It is true that Phaedo explains to Echementes that the executioner has advised that Socrates cease talking because talk warms the body, which slows the poison, and that he will have to drink it several times as a consequence. Socrates is unwilling to stop talking. He prefers a slow death. Quote, let him mind his business and be prepared to give the poison two or three times if necessary. That is all. Just before this interference by the guard, Siebes had asked why Socrates says, quote, that a man not to take his own life, but that the philosopher will be ready to follow the dying. In the midst of this conversation on the rightness of suicide, Socrates then touches his feet to the ground and remains in that very position of sitting for the remainder of the dialogue. He occupies the space of staying, of slow death. He takes, as it were, the corpse pose, while also refusing to silence himself in a way that will defer the action of the poison. He separates his body from his voice, the body in the attitude of death and the voice in the attitude of the living, a voice that this dialogue will position as living on after death. The voice and image become separated from each other, only to be virtually reintegrated by Descartes' act of meditation, something we have always suspected to be a bit, a bit of a perverse suture. Characteristically, Socrates then asks Sebes, in response to the question of suicide, if he had ever heard Philolaus speak on this topic. And indeed, Socrates has always gotten his words from somewhere else. He's a lover of talk. Sebes responds that he never much understood Philolaus. It is in this moment that the body of Socrates takes on the pose of death. Quote, my words too are only an echo, but I am very willing to say what I have heard. Plato, in depicting Socrates in this way, slowly extracts the voice from the body of the master to assume it for himself. This is, of course, Plato's project as enacted across the dialogues. But here the operation is performed as a condition of possibility for Platonic textuality. The words and teachings of Socrates are immortalized as Plato's, the insemination and dissemination that Plato will not only call dialectic, but that will found the very motion of the academy of teaching, the academy as teaching living on, disembodied voices of masters re-embodied and reanimated. Surrounding Socrates in his slow death are his disciples who will carry the voice on for him after death. It is the primary scene of the academy. 
Echementes had implored Phaedo to tell him what had happened as exactly as possible. He wants nothing from that scene to be missed, as if by accident to be lost. The reanimation of the voice of Socrates by way of Phaedo will make that possible. Phaedo remarks, quote, that there is no greater pleasure than to have Socrates brought to my recollection, whether I speak myself or hear another speak of him. Again, Echementes implore, implores Phaedo to be as exact as he can, exact replication. This is no mere recollection, but an incantation of the soul by way of the voice. This is a seance, but one that removes precarity from the scene, one that in fact converts it away from having been a scene of loss. If nothing was lost, nothing must be regained. Arendt notes in The Human Condition that no one survives her supreme act. The supreme act is a suicidal mission that necessarily hands the life narrative over to others. If speech and action together form a fundamental unit for Arendt, in the supreme act they become separate, the acting body no longer speaking on its behalf, but handing over its voice to others who become responsible for telling the story. Conrad's Heart of Darkness is constructed in precisely this way. Kurt's handing over his last words to Marlowe, who can only use them as an Ariadne's thread to retrieve the missing life that issued them. One cannot guarantee that such a narrative will fit or encapsulate the agent, there being a precarity within the supreme act in which, and become fully an agent, one then relinquishes that status totally. Agency cannot be permanent or else it is despotism. It is timely and temporal. In the corpse pose, Socrates plays a trick. He plays dead, as it were, ensuring that the final discourse belonging to the supreme act will be spoken in his own voice. He maintains control over the logos and the dissemination of his supreme act. He does the unthinkable. He tells his own story after death. He becomes a ventriloquist. It is said that Plato, so disgusted by the immorality of Socrates' death sentence, disappeared for a time before returning to found the Academy of Athens. We can think about this dialogue as dramatizing the beginnings of what we continue to call the Academy. I want now to turn to a passing moment when Socrates' wife is asked to leave the space of dialogue, a dramatization of the disambiguation of listening, and if you recall, it is both pathetikos and logikos, the separation of logos from pathos, the soul from the body. On entering, we found Socrates just released from chains and Xantippa, whom you know, sitting by him and holding his child in her arms. When she saw us, she uttered a cry and said, as women will, O oh, Socrates, this is the last time that either you will converse with your friends or they with you. Socrates turned to Crito and said, Crito, let someone take her home. Some of Crito's people accordingly led her away, crying out and beating herself. They banish her as the trace of their own grief they cannot express if they are to still occupy the realm of philosophy, constructed as it is by the space of talk. She was there, but not as a disciple. She remains embedded in the margins of fiction, the body as trappings. Where does Antipa go? She is, as it were, off screen. She is escort escorted off the stage. In a final gesture before returning at the end of the dialogue, as if it's very shell to its kernel, she beats her breast, the gesture that seems to localize all that Socrates will go on to discard from the theory of the soul, the prison of the body. She has a right to be angry. Sometimes there are no words, and one must beat one's own breast and cry out. The foundation of the city, as has been well established in various accounts of the noble lie, is also founded upon banishment, or what Ramona Nadaf calls exiling the poets. If the soul and the city are in such perfect figuration, one that will admit of no distance, no relayer between signifier and signified, then the soul's various lack of admittance are also founded upon exile. This exile is perhaps uh, dramatized nowhere more vividly than in banishing Socrates' wife from the scene of the last argument. We know that we must attend to Plato's props and the scenes as they are elaborated just before becoming the site of dialogue. It is there that Derrida finds the pharmacon, hiding in the offhanded remark about playing with the pharmacia or the winds of Boreas. What's more, the banishment can only be externally dramatized taking the shape of dramaturgy or scene in which embodied figures stand in for the disembodied. 
It is in the process that the dialogue conducts its ultimate sleight of hand, transferring the dying master's discourse to Phaedo, who himself stands in for the body of Plato. The insensible must be made sensible within the space of discourse. It is in the props, in the proscenium, and scaffolding that the figures function to support the argument are both constructed and discarded. This banishment functions centrally in the, theories of con the theory of contraries as laid out in Phaedo and elsewhere. One proof for the immortality of the soul is that its contrary is death and that, op um, and that opposites will not admit their opposite. Socrates says, again through the mouth of Phaedo, as the number two brings forward the opposite of the odd and fire that of cold and so forth, for there are plenty of examples. Now, see if you accept this statement. Not only will opposites not admit their opposites, but nothing which brings an opposite to that which it approaches will ever admit in itself the oppos oppositeness of that which is brought. Now let me refresh your memory. For there is no harm in repetition. The number five will not admit the idea of the even, nor will 10. The double of five admit the idea of the odd. Now 10 is not itself an opposite, and yet it will not admit the idea of the odd. Will not admit is a common translation across many of Plato's texts for this demonstration that proves exact contraries. For the poetically inspired or divine truth before the secularization of speech, however, it was otherwise. As Marcel Detienne writes, there can be no aletheia without a measure of lethe or oblivion. Negativity is not isolated from being. It borders the truth and forms its inseparable shadow. The two antithetical powers are thus not contrary, but tend toward each other. The positive tends towards the negative, which in a way denies it, but cannot maintain itself in its absence." End quote. Socrates' theory of admittance is related to a physical border. To admit, or decomai, is to accept, but in the manner of receiving or even giving a warm welcome as in a home to welcome, but in the middle voice, so highly related to the self that is acting or reflexive, uh, will not admit into itself. One is reminded of a different border in the Republic, the one that establishes the, the polis as the homology for the soul. Socrates there imagines a man who could imitate anything. What if this man were to appear in the city? Socrates describes a scene of sanctification and sacrament. They would kneel down before and garland this man as a god, just before saying that there is no room for a man such as this in the city. It is not then that such a man does not exist, but rather that he cannot be admitted. The scene concerns turning the poet away as if at the borders of the city, decomai. Admittance of the soul then turns out to be related in figurative and figuring ways to the presence of music and poetry or sacred speech the soul continually visualized as a body. But the space outside of dialogue is feminized, which turns on various forms of admittance and banishment. Acceptance or admittance in the English turn of phrase has two meanings that I think can be located in this principle of decomai as difference excised from logic. Decomai is the principle of ambiguity because in such admittance, or what we would call in English acceptance, and here I, I really want you to hear the two, the two ways of, of saying that phrase, to accept. Um, this is the state in which contraries abide. In acceptance, a contrary is allowed a place and warm welcome inside. It is not subsumed or negated, per persists in its status as other. In isolating ambiguity as the sophistic principle, we turn on what it um, means to admit death and the space that claims to be a practice of dying turns out to be the one that secures the objective of eternal life, to admit, to accept. Xantippa is someone who admits death. It is just after Xantippa is not admitted that Socrates invokes his recurring dream and the intimation of his daemon, which demands that he make music. Nearing death and in obedience to this dream, he quickly composes a few lines of verse. It is, however, with obedience and not serious thought that he should have lived otherwise. I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with this scene where he says, I've often had this dream, my daemon saying to me, Socrates, make music. Socrates, in order to continue his creed, 
must ignore the literal dimension of what the daemon demands. Nietzsche, of course, calls attention to this to suggest that, indeed, the daemon might be saying, make music. Even in death, Socrates will not acknowledge the ambiguity of listening. He converts the signifier into metaphor, suggesting that the most beautiful music he could have made is philosophy. If there is a rhetorical act within this final moment, it is at the level of narrative. Plato reminds us that this is a man who can only listen in one direction at once, whose life has been to purify the logos of the body. Even in his last moment, he is deaf to the possibility that his own mode of listening has been falsely construed, purging the voice of the daemon, what he cannot allow. In Freudian terms, this final act of listening is for Nainung, a refusal to listen between the lines, negating the voice of the daemon as it invites Socrates into two meanings that might be fundamentally incompatible. He listens univocally, for in willing death there can be no paranoia, only absolute repose that life has been correctly lived. The daemon is itself ambiguous, both divine and mortal. In the Cratylus, Socrates speculates an etymology of the daemon that is consistent with this project of expurgation, that the word daemon is synonymous with knowing or wise. However, it is probably more closer to something like to divide, to distribute destinies, to a lot. The daemon then is, not, is then not so much a class of divine beings, but a peculiar mode of activity. Socrates refuses this occult division and distribution enacted by the daemon. If the daemon pronounces and ma makes itself audible, it is with and as the force of sophistry, which deconstitutes it as substance and identifies in the very same act of pronouncement. It is not to say, but to divide and ambiguate. The daemon is not visible to oneself, but only audible, which is the realm of ambiguity and sophistry. The peculiar nature of the daemon is to be behind one's back, visible only to others. In the Apology, Plato notes that the daemon's voice is never prescriptive, it only ever warns. In Phaedo, it will finally issue a single imperative to make music. What is it to make music and how does Socrates interpret this command? First, he finds in it the description of a life already lived. For him, there is no trace of the future or imperative tense just in case he haphazardly pens a few, few lines. This returns us to the broader project of expunging sophistic ambiguity, an ambiguity which makes itself felt as admittance between contrary bodies, decomai. This admittance between contraries, the possibility that Socrates uh, could have lived an opposite life, appears under the sign of music. It is resonance between contraries. Music is left to the side and, until it reappears in the middle of the dialogue, where there's a section on harmony. The section returns us to the question of music, but it's, again, it's meant only to elaborate the theory of the soul as it cannot admit death. Socrates has just been rehearsing to Simeus his theory of knowledge as recollection and the immortality of the soul, and he opens up his argument to dispute. And Simeus here proposes a dip to, to read the issue of harmony differently. Quote, might not a person use the same argument about harmony and the lyre? The lyre, the instrument. That has a nice difference. Um, might he not say that the harmony is a thing invisible, incorporeal, fair, divine, abiding in the lyre which is harmonized, but that the lyre and the strings are matter and material, composite, earthly, and akin to mortality? Simeus, in other words, has a materialist view of harmony. It is for him a resonance of a material body. Without the instrument, there can be no harmony. For Socrates, harmony is idea. As resonance for Simeus, it needs a vibrating body to exist, wood, form, touch. Socrates ignores the very verb of the daemon's command, to make music. This returns us to Socrates' meditation on wholeness and his rejection of the compound. Socrates retorts, quote, you still maintain that harmony is a compound and that the soul is a harmony which is made of strings set in the frame of the body. For you, you will surely never allow yourself to say that a harmony is prior to the elements which compose the harmony. For Socrates, harmony is prior as an ideal. Is not resonance then the literal remainder of Socratic dialectic, one that signals its death now by the force of its submerged ground? 
The scene of philosophic transmission is exposed to that which it had to, to forfeit to become itself, to the temporality of sounding and then decay, expectation and memory. What makes it a scene if not its borders and banishments, the trappings of the dialogue in its dramaturgy, its body. We are perhaps more aware of Socrates' condemnation and ultimate exile of music in the Republic, but this account of mimesis pertains less to the problem of resonance than to the problem of the many-voicedness of the bard, his, his ability to pervert and distort what should be the single-voicedness of the soul. Ultimately, the problem with music in the Republic is that it reveals that the soul is not unto itself. It is all too malleable. It is because it has been made lending to the soul a human duration, a porousness, and a proneness. Music announces that the soul is an ear into which adverse influence pours. Music is the primary remainder of the soul, undoing its claim to immortality. As Adorno writes in Negative Dialectics, quote, even in music, the impulse animating the first bar will not be fulfilled at once, but only in further articulation. Music, we might add then, is a rhetorical force. That's me. Music, we might add then, is a rhetorical force. It desubstantiates, converts identity into the warning that things might be otherwise. Socrates, in a final gesture, banishes music again. Philosophy is the only music he has made. As Nietzsche recalls of this moment, quote, where art was concerned, the despotic logician has the sense of a lacuna, a void, something of a reproach, of a possibly neglected duty. I return then to the scene of Xantippa's banishment. She is the reminder of the body. She intrudes with physical emotion of, uh, upon the scene of dialogue. She's a critic. If the daemon exclaims the force of ambiguity that is nullified into metaphor, Xantippa cries out in ways that cannot be redeemed by thought. She cries out in the face of the unthinkable, but also against the object of thought. Socrates does in language what he will not allow the body, which is tantamount to suicide. He kills the voice of the daemon that, so that he can be released from its possibility. In a final act, Socrates asserts the agency of thought over the force of ambiguity. It is a voice that says it might have been otherwise. The overarching rhetorical act of, of Phaedo then is to assert that there are no second acts in philosophy, only primary acts that are passed on. One can only one can not only negate to the very end, but can instill one's receivers the charge of living on. His friends and listeners will love, live on, spreading the word of philosophy. Um, and thus, uh, he banishes her from the scene of dying, and thus from the charge of transmitting dying. These two expulsions are mutual. No one will be there to remember the alternative. Again, however, Plato builds this, wis this witnessing into the dramaturgy. We hear Socrates' refusal of ambiguity, and, can, and it cannot help but color the remaining discourse. Plato continually begins with these excisions, these places that should have been cut, that tarry from the side, uh, or the remainder of discourse. Xantippa says more about the space of dialogue and leaving it than those who stay there to continue to erect it. Um, are we to commend what I am suggesting is Socrates' unwillingness to die, his refusal to stop talking while putting his body in the attitude of death? The question of suicide remains open as a moralistic act. In self-destruction, does one transcend the outrage as in the master-slave dialectic? Are we to mime Socrates' slow death, continually to take the poison as many times as made necessary by the continuity of talk? Or is there an ethical imperative towards suicide and what would that suicide look like? In our moment, do we simply receive the administered death? How does one with agency kill a bureaucra bureaucratically embodied ideal? Indeed, I'm reading the death of Socrates as the birth of an institution of disembodied thought, and with it, the implied ending of that institution in our own moment, the insistence that it die a slow death. Socrates teaches not just institutionalized thought, but he teaches the politics of slow death. Do I, do I have a few more minutes yeah. or? Okay. I just have one strand of the argument I want to weave in. Um, we might think of Antigone here and her redoubled act of burial. She buries and then reburies the corpse that, it had, that had been unburied by the state. The corpse of her brother um, is to remain exposed, if you remember. 
Something in the space of politics is not being granted burial, and with it, forgetting. If the corpse can't be buried, it can't be forgotten. If it cannot be forgotten, it cannot be remembered. And this is a, another quote from Nicole Lara. Quote, between dying and being dead, rituals took place. And no one had the right to be called dead unless the funerary rites had been performed in his honor, author and his CK to enter the misty kingdom of the underworld, end quote. In unburying him and preventing rites, Creon, in fact, divests Polynices of the right to be called dead. He is still dying, and the process of dying is slowed and repeated. There is then, between Xantippa and, Ag and Antigone, not a politics of refusal. We might think of Antigone's claim being to refuse to deny. But there is a politics of avowal in the face of disavowal, a rhetorical castration that announces the fetish concealing lack, to avow lack. Again, Socrates' sleight of hand. At the end of the dialogue, when Xantippa and other women return, Socrates again ushers them away. He denies women their traditional intervention of being the ones to prepare the body for death. As Laura notes, quote, his companions in thought take the place of the women. The emergence of this speaking subject is out of this displacement. The disciples then begin to cry. What is this strange outcry, Socrates said, I, th I thought I asked all the women to leave. The form of memory that Socrates' account won't allow is, is a sound that makes no mark on immortality, the sounding out of the scene as seen. The women are taken from the scene and with them their cries. We are not to regard the argument as Socrates' last words, but rather a re request issued to Crito as, as his acting body. Socrates' last words are, Crito, we owe a cock to Asclepius. Will you remember to pay the debt? In the last words, then, mnemonics and patrimony are united in a single utterance. They are united, they are united as logos and the truth of speech. Only that which never ceases to hurt stays in the memory, writes Nietzsche in the genealogy. Socrates' last argument has asserted the immortality of the soul in the theory of knowledge as recollection. But this is a different form of memory that takes the shape of debt and indebtedness. Is it not also foundational? It is the primary gesture of the institution founded upon the practice of dialectical discourse as debt. Crito takes on the debt while Phaedo takes on the voice. But the meaning of telos is not goal, but end as already implied by the beginning. For Phaedo to embody the voice of the master, he must also embody his debt. Something of Socrates' material burden is preserved after death and passed on, even as the corpse pose merges with its reality in death. It is unclear if it is a kind of personal debt or a collective debt. The debt shall be paid, answers Crito. But it is the remainder of Socrates' body after he consigns it to oblivion in the discourse of the soul. Quote, I cannot make Crito believe that I am the same Socrates who have been talking and conducting this argument. He fancies I am the other Socrates whom he will soon bury, a dead body. And he asks, how shall he bury me, end quote. But the real question is, how shall he bury me while also trying to repay me? If debt and indebtedness are integrated into the foundation of the academy, the answer is that he cannot. The dead will remain unburied. The soul is immortal, but that immortality is upheld chiefly by the memorial of what was Socrates' unforgettable body. Thank you. <laughs>